All right, today we are continuing our journey into the Sermon on the Mount. And you may say, well, we're going to be in the Sermon on the Mount the next few weeks. Why? Because, as I mentioned to you last week, the Sermon on the Mount, for me, is the most comprehensive body of teaching when it comes to the sanctity of life, the most pro-life body of teaching in Scripture. Because it's, just, it's not just about life, it's about every aspect of life, where Jesus talks about caring for creation. God takes care of the birds of the air and the lilies of the field. It's about loving enemies and how to treat enemies and how to remember that we are not called to dehumanize people or marginalize people, but rather to be in relationship and at times even reconciling relationship one to another. And so we're going to talk about the Sermon on the Mount because this is really the ethic whereby Jesus calls us to live. You want to know how to live as a Christ follower? It's in the Sermon on the Mount. It's very easy. If you read the Sermon on the Mount, it gives you a prescription for almost every circumstance in life. What kind of attitude are you supposed to have as a Christ follower? Read the Sermon on the Mount. Okay? Are you receiving some kind of hardship or in a hard circumstance? Read the Sermon on the Mount. Do you need to pray? Do you learn how to pray? It's in the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus tells us how to pray. Do you need to know how to go about drawing near to Christ? Read the Sermon on the Mount. Or if you're judging another person or the recipient of somebody who judges you, go to the Sermon on the Mount. There is a word for both the oppressed and the oppressor equally in the Sermon on the Mount. And so we're going to go through, not the whole sermon, but parts of the sermon that really speak and affirm the sanctity of all life to the point that even the lives of those who oppress you or persecute you are even attested and affirmed by Jesus that they too are sacred whether or not they treat your life as sacred. Because each life is sacred. Not because of people and how you determine who is sacred, but because God has determined that we're all sacred. Our lives are all sacred. And in that case, it's a very challenging word. But as we pray for, as Jesus taught us to pray, Lord, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You say, how does your will uh, get done? And how does the kingdom come? It is by this ethic in the Sermon on the Mount whereby we live as citizens of the kingdom. And, uh, and it shows us uh, how to live under God's reign, God's kingdom, and Jesus Christ. As Jesus' central theme is how to be kingdom citizens. How to be children of God. And not only how to treat one another, but even, yes, how to treat people who may be antagonists. Okay? I have a little exercise for you today. It's a little different today. And you're, I'm going to give you about four minutes, five minutes. I'm not going to rush you. Um, but I want you in your table, I want you to have a conversation with your friends at your table, okay? Or if you don't like each other, you're going to have to talk to each other anyway. And have a conversation about what, how would you describe the kingdom of God or the reign of God to somebody who's never heard that term or somebody who's a new believer? How would you do that? So talk in your group. How would you talk amongst yourselves? How would you describe the kingdom of God uh, to somebody who, who asked you, what's the kingdom of God? Uh, so talk amongst yourselves. You have five minutes. So uh, five themes of God's kingdom. Light, joy, redemption, peace. And peace is overall shalom. It's that peacemaking, it's that active work of peace and coming to a, it's, it's basically coming home to yourself and coming home to God, coming home to the Lord. It's restoration. When Jesus healed people, sometimes he said, follow me, but nine times out of ten, what did he say? Go home. Be with your family. Go show yourself to the priest. You're made well. Go and be with your family. Uh, peace is that restoration, that healing presence. And justice and righteousness. Justice and righteousness are, are um, one and the same. So he boils it down to the kingdom of God, down to these five kind of uh, both action words and, and virtue, you know, virtues. This idea of, of being people of light, um, you know, living in the light of the Lord. All right? And um, when, what we'll do is we're going to turn now, now that we talk about the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God, we're going to turn to the Sermon on the Mount and see that when Jesus preaches on the kingdom of God, notice his first order of business, 
is to hold up, now this is a theory I have, and what I mean by theory is I came up with this, so you need to let me know if it works, okay? So this is what I thought of. This is the Beatitudes are Jesus' stop sign to the world. Stop. Because we're doing things differently. Okay? Stop. So the Beatitudes say stop to the culture of power and of, of marginalization. Stop to a culture in which people get their way or uh, get their way at the expense of others or exploit others. Stop. That's, that was kind of my idea. If it works, let me know later. All right. The Beatitudes are Jesus' stop sign to the culture and society in which he and we lived. They are also called macarisms, which um, you can change it to happy. So not only blessed are those, but happy are those. It's a posture in life. It's an attitude, uh, a posture in life that... Blessed is a place of blessed is a, a place of finding peace, of finding that, that fulfillment. And the reason why it's a stop sign is because it doesn't say blessed are those who have everything, those who are wealthy, those who are well taken care of. No. Jesus goes all the way to the margins of those who are forgotten and downtrodden, and those who are in a posture of submission and surrender unto the Lordship of Christ. So let's read through them real fast, and then we'll talk about them. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And I want you to notice like the, what goes with each. The poor inherit the kingdom, okay? Remember, uh, what was that show, Silver Spoons? Or the poor kid, or anyway, early 80s. All right, <laughs> sorry. Um, or Annie, is that better, Annie? No. You know, okay, Annie, we all know Orphan Annie. <laughs> so it's the poor, it's the poor who inherit the wealth of the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven. Uh, in, in Luke, Luke says, blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So it's not just poor in spirit, but blessed are the poor. The poor in spirit. Okay? Uh, blessed are those who... What's that? Oh. Blessed are those who mourn, or grieve, or lament. Uh, uh, some, some people think that this idea of mourning is also that mourning of repentance. Whenever mourning is discussed in the Old Testament, there are always is not only lament of the world and mourning and grief in the world, but grief of our own depravity, our own that calls for us uh, to repent. So blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Question. Yes? How would you describe, in the first one, poor in spirit? We're not talking financially, so what is poor in spirit? Would you like to answer that for us? I would say hungering for God's spirit. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's um, if you look at people, well, I don't want to say people because that's judging, but um, there are those who are very self-righteous, who act like they know it all, and are willing, so willing to think that they're so self-righteous that they actually end up thinking that others are not. And I think a poverty of spirit is knowing just how depraved we are, you know? It's a posture of humility. Um, because the Lord can't fill people who come to him who have full hearts and are full of themselves. So we come as an act of surrender with humility, um, poor in spirit. Now Luke says, blessed are the poor, which is not just poor in spirit, but also a disposition of those who are left out, you know, those who are left out or left behind. Okay, so those who are left out, left behind, those who lament or mourn, um, those who grieve for the condition of the world. Uh, blessed are the meek. Verse five. Meek um, can also be termed humble. Uh, notice that it's the humble, not the warrior, who inherits the earth, the land. So this is one of the only bad beatitudes here that actually tie a people to a land. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And it's the humble, not the warriors, the proud warriors who hum, who inherit the earth. Notice that there's an inheritance, which implies children, okay? These are those who humble, that they know they're God's child, that don't have to fight on for themselves or you know get their own piece of pie, so to speak. They know that they are at the Lord's um, sustenance, okay? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed, uh, and this idea of righteousness 
or justice or right living. Uh, a hunger and thirst. Notice that there's emptiness or scarcity. You have a scarcity of pride, you're meat. You have a scarcity of, of, um, of, of abundance or things, you're, you're poor in spirit. Uh, uh, if, you, um, you know, if you have a scarcity of, uh, of that, that uh, being full or satisfaction and you're hunger and thirst for the things that are wrong in the world, then you shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Uh, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's a good one, pure in heart, for they shall see God. Um, what is it that um, stands in your way of seeing God? Remember, Jesus said, uh, why do you look at the plant, at the, uh, the, uh, uh, the speck in your neighbor's eye when you have a plank in your own? Okay. Um, That's why you have your coffee every morning. <laughs> so you can open your eyes. No, it's on coffee. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. The coffee inside helps too. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Um, let me see if I have any notes here. We're going to talk about these, by the way. I'm just reading them for now and making comments. Blessed are the peacemakers. Notice that it's an active verb. Blessed are those who make peace. Peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Children of God. How do I know that you're God's child? You're a peacemaker. Are you always trying to cause division or trouble? You know, or just trying to make waves or stir pots? Can I really tell if you're a child of God or just replicating your favorite soap opera character on TV? You know? Peacemakers, for you shall be called children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, <clears throat> blessed are you now notice that the Lord changes it and directs it to the whole audience now not just in general terms but now he's turning it to the disciples as he's moving from the, the kind of that stop sign to now this applies to all y'all okay meaning um, because this is going to happen to you if you follow me okay blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account Rejoice and be glad. Now, I told you, you know, if you just follow the Sermon on the Mount, it's very easy. It's very easy. Somebody reviles you, talks about you, talks evil, just rejoice and be glad. Because that's, I do that all the time. I'm so good at rejoicing and being glad when people speak evil about me. I am so good at it, I am a model citizen to my entire household. Christina says, oh, Joe, you're just amazing. You always rejoice and you're so glad when people are reviling you. And she just swoons every time. <laughs> that is step-by-step, folks. <laughs> it's so easy. And what I mean by it's so easy, it's right here. You know, there is no mystery of the kingdom. This is not mysterious stuff. You don't have to play Monopoly and win in order to understand this. You just need to read it and live it. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so, um, let's see, for so men persecuted the prophets who are before you. What makes you so special? Oh, that's my inclusion, I'm sorry. What makes you so special? You know? I had a counselor tell me once, you know, I was meeting with a counselor, you know, through ministry, you know, and uh, I said, you know, it's, it's tough, you know, being a pastor of the church, this and that. She says, well, what makes, what makes you so special? Have you ever read the Bible? You know? <laughs> Think you're better than Moses, you know? Complained all the time. All right. But it's, it's a good point. What makes you so special? You are, and then he turns to this, this idea. We separate this, but this is connected. We're going to read through um, 16 because this is kind of connected. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its salt, taste, how can its, salt, this, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out, trodden underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hid, nor do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. Let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So that's the idea, is to be salt and light in the world and to be citizens of the kingdom, children of God. And it's by living into this idea, this act of surrender, this idea of lament, this hunger, this thirst, this idea of being merciful by seeking purity, 
um, by being peacemakers, um, and, and by, by blessing those who persecute you, or rejoice and show gladness in the face of, of hardship, um, and to let your good works shine before for others. Um, <clears throat> all right. So we've kind of gone through this. Uh, your thoughts, your points? I wanted to just get through it before we, we talk, but 